All right. Um, so uh, today I will move on, and I will mostly focus on um, experimental realization. So I will start with uh, experimental realizations of my runner zero energy modes and present several proposals um, starting from historically reviewing the first one and then going to the basically state of the art in the field. But um, before I do so, I wanted to recapitulate what I covered uh, yesterday and I wanted to emphasize that basically I started with this toy uh, model um, spinless P-wave superconductor and then I try to scrutinize the, this model and take into account uh, various effects such as interactions and disorder which uh, are inherently present in the physical set in realistic settings and what I showed you yesterday that this topological phase will be stable in some um, parameter space so let me just emphasize that that this phase is stable, so if this is strength of interactions, then, um, well, I had the parameter K, but as long as interactions are not strongly repulsive, um, then the topological phase is stable. Um, this axis describes disorder, which I will label one over tau. Tau is the um, scattering time, and as long as the scattering time is not uh, short enough, we have a topological phase. So this is the phase where this topological superconductor lives and then outside. Um, and it's important because there is region of stability of this phase. So we should expect that we might be able to realize this phase in actually in realistic experiments. Okay? So it's not you know, point one, it's not some specific point actually. There is a finite, well-defined region. Okay. So, um, so now I will discuss basically three different routes uh, how to realize my run of zero energy states in topological superconductors. Um, and the first system that I will talk about is strontium rutonate. Um, it's certain material, certain oxide material, which um, you know, has been uh, around for more than 20 years and it's been predicted that it's has this chiral P wave superconductivity. And then I'll discuss topological insulator, uh, superconductor heterostructures, and then spin orbit coupled semiconductor S wave superconductor heterostructure. So um, back in 95, several people proposed that strontium rutonite, rutonate has this um, other parameter, spin triplet P wave pairing. Um, and they uh, suggested that it might also break time reversal symmetry. So uh, it's an interesting superconductor which uh, spontaneously breaks not only U1 symmetry but also time reversal symmetry. And in this sense, it's quite unusual. So this is the um, structure, realistic structure. You have uh, strontium atoms, these are ruthenium atoms, and there are oxides. Very similar to actually high DC material. Uh, but transition temperature is actually very low um, and we know that it's unconventional superconductor because DC strongly varies with disorder, situation of disorder. So uh, as you know, most of superconductors with the exception of S-wave um, are very sensitive to disorder and uh, when disorder actually becomes uh, comparable to um, you know, when the gap becomes comparable to the scale 1 or tau, most of the superconductors actually are destroyed by disorder. So that's the feature of unconventional superconductivity. We also know uh, from susceptibility measurements that it's a triplet superconductor. And now I want to review um, actually what is the evidence for time reversal symmetry breaking um, in this superconducting state. All right? So, uh, the proposed other parameter is Px plus Ipy. Um, just wanted to mention that under time reversal, we have these rules. Okay, so uh, this other parameter does not get back to itself and actually breaks time reversal symmetry as well as two-dimensional parity. 
Now, of course, this is a spinful system. So for each spin, we will have a chiral edge Majorana mode. And therefore, you know, total churn number is equal to. So um, one of the evidence for a, a, actually a canonical way of detecting whether there is a time reversal symmetry breaking in a system or not is through um, perfectometry techniques. Okay? So we know that uh, if you send linear polarized light uh, on the sample um, because circular polarization right and left have different um, refraction coefficients that they will propagate in a different way. So when they either transmit or, or get reflected, uh, there will be a phase that is picked up. Um, and this phase is proportional to the, to the degree of time reversal symmetry breaking in the system. Uh, so in um, 2000, actually for a while, Arn Kapitulnik from Stanford was de developing this very sensitive technique which is called uh, loopless Sanyak interferometer. The idea is that this interferometer uh, uses essentially the same path. So there is this optical fiber, and this optical fiber has uh, two modes. There is a, um, and, and so the light which propagates forward uses one of the modes, and then the light that propagates backwards using, is using the other mode. And so the idea is that we want to exclude all the ge geometrical effects. So normally in uh, interferometer, you'll have you know, different path, different, some area enclosed in the interferometer. So we have to take into account you know, the geometrical factor. But here, the, the light goes through the same path. So there is no geometrical factor. Um, and as such, such interferometers uh, can be made much more precise. As a matter of fact, the precision that, uh, of this device has been improved by a factor of a thousand compared to the you know, other state of the art. So this is the data that uh, he reported in 2006 that um, as you lower the temperature, uh, at some point around T of the order 1.5 Kelvin, the uh, Kerr angle, so this is a reflection experiment, the Kerr angle uh, starts to uh, increase and saturates at low temperatures to some number. And at the same time, this is a plot of uh, resistivity. You can see that, you know, essentially this, is, uh, this point corresponds to superconducting transition, which supports the idea that superconducting state spontaneously breaks uh, time reversal symmetry. So if you want to understand this experiment, we need to understand um, uh, the Kerr angle, we need to calculate the Kerr angle, and um, the, the Kerr angle is essentially proportional to the uh, whole component, whole conductivity at finite frequency. And the frequency of this experiment is huge. Essentially, it's an optical frequency, so it's order of EVs. But nevertheless, the interferometer is sensitive enough, and you can see in the numbers, um, it measures 10 to the minus 9 radians. It's sensitive enough to pick up very tiny effects. So, um, so let's try to understand this whole conductivity. Let's try to see how we can compute um, this quantity. So conventional wisdom tells you that, well, if you want to compute whole conductivity in insulators or, or, or metals, you have to um, use linear response theory, right? Um, and linear response theory can be formulated in terms of uh, diagrams. And essentially, we have to compute you know, this diagram. So you have currents, Vx and Vy, um, at the uh, vertices, and then we have to compute this bubble. Well, surprisingly, for a chiral T wave superconductor, this quantity is actually zero. So the question is you know, how can we reconcile the theory and the experiment. Well, it turns out that this system um, has a different mechanism for uh, chiral uh, for for a whole conductivity, and I, will, I would like to explain. I think it's quite cute. Um, so, the idea is that we, we have to go back and try to analyze all the terms, try to develop a general gauge invariant theory for such a superconductor, and analyze all the terms. <coughs> that um, appear after integrating fermionic degrees of freedom. So 
you'll write the action for a uh, superconductor at, within the mean field approximation, and then we add um, electromagnetic field coupling to the electromagnetic field. Um, um, so then we will integrate out fermions and obtain some effective theory. So uh, when you do this kind of calculation, um, there are several terms which uh, will appear in this action. Uh, some of the terms are just standard terms that you will encounter also in s superconductor. They just describe the collective behavior of the superconducting <coughs> phase. Uh, and then there, are, there will be special terms. Um, these terms are characteristic to this chiral P-wave superconductor, and so we will have to we will focus on those terms. Okay. So um, it turns out that one of the terms that appear in the theory is very similar to the Chern-Simons action. Um, in fact, you know, it, it has some part of the Chern-Simons action, but it also also has some important distinctions. So, so this essentially corresponds to magnetic field, um, and this part is like density uh, component of the Chern-Simons action. But instead of having the, um, you know, we have here additional term which is proportional to the phase of the order parameter. Another important distinction that this this action is uh, gauge invariant. So as you know, uh, Chern-Simons theory is uh, um, gauge invariant in the bulk, but if you have a boundary, then you have to supplement with the uh, edge currents to restore gauge uh, invariance. Well, in this case, you don't have to do that because this combination is actually gauge invariant. It's, um, and, and, and therefore, in some sense, we can see already some differences. So, as a matter of fact, um, if you try to uh, use this action and add this additional term uh, which doesn't break time reversal symmetry, what you find in the end of the day is this expression. So um, indeed there is a whole conductivity, but this whole conductivity is vanishing when you, when you send Q to zero first and then omega to zero, okay? So normally when you compute uh, transport um, and you take, um, you want to compute say current or whatever, uh, in the DC limit, then we, we send Q to zero first and then omega to zero. And so a uh, formal answer that you, you will get that, well, well, this quantity is just vanishing. And this happens because basically superconductors are very special. Whenever we have some um, magnetic moments due to the orbital effects in the, in the bulk, um, these magnetic moments will be screened by the superconducting phase because of the Meissner effect. So superconductors don't like to have magnetic fields. And so they, um, a, 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 any magnetic field in the bulk will be screened by the uh, supercurrents. And that's this reflection here. So essentially, this phase will be adjusted to the A0 in such a way that will compensate entirely and will um, set this action to be equal to zero. Um, another explanation uh, is the following. So um, the system that you might consider, the model you might consider, has Galileo invariance. So uh, which means that, well, if this spontaneous time reversal symmetry breaking comes from interactions, um, then um, it, if you apply some electric field, this electric field will couple to the center uh, of mass of the Cooper pair, which is now which now has some orbital. Uh, moment, right? And since it couples to the center of mass, and there is no scattering of these Cooper pairs from impurities, there is no shear of these impurities, um, you know, in, in the system, this is pristine model, then there is no reason when we apply electric field, this Cooper pair will move sideways, right? Because it just couples to the center of motion, and this, uh, this Cooper pair happens to rotate around the um, axis with some um, you know, in some direction. So you can imagine a baseball, okay, and you know, the ba baseball that's spinning, but without no friction, the, the baseball will not uh, deflect sideways, right? So, um, and so that's another explanation why whole continuity in a pristine system will vanish. 
So we kind of get to a certain puzzle here that, um, uh, um, but this puzzle might be resolved if uh, we consider system with disorder. Okay, so if you have disorder, disorder adds essentially shear to your baseball, and then of course the deflection will depend on the um, um, angular momentum of the Cooper pair. Okay. So um, this is a standard way of computing disorder. So you have, if you have a Gaussian disorder, which is uh, what normally people consider, this is the schematic way. So you try to compute first self energy um, by summing diagrams here. Um, then you also uh, want to consider vertex corrections, and then you consider the um, diagram, which corresponds to this uh, uh, whole conductivity. So. Uh, another an, another um, way of taking into account disorder is to include also some non-Gaussian disorder effects. Um, so our approximation um, that disorder is Gaussian, it's an approximation. There might be some tiny non-Gaussian feature in the distribution of disorder. And since we are measuring small quantity, we should be open to um, reconsider all the models and um, include those effects. And in fact, if you just consider pure Gaussian disorder, um, this uh, calculation basically gives you zero. Um, and uh, one is forced to consider some other effects. So um, then if you do that, it turns out that, well, you get some answer which will depend on disorder concentration. Uh, and in fact, you will have some whole conductivity. Uh, and here I'm showing the uh, response for a real part and imaginary part of the response function. And then you can see that uh, at finite at frequencies, large frequencies, this is the gap scale. At large frequencies, uh, we will have some tails. And presumably, this experiment was uh, picking up on you know, these tails. So, uh, so, but the conclusion of this calculation is that, well, this whole angle that is measured is not a universal quantity. It's certainly not proportional to anything that is quantized in units of 2 is over h. And the reason it's not universal because of the Meissner effect. And this, will, uh, this quantity will be proportional to disorder concentration and will be different in different samples. So if we try to fit the theory and experiment, then uh, actually we can see quite uh, you know, a nice agreement between data and experiment. And the theoretical prediction is that you know, the current angle is about 40 nanoradians. Well, that's one of the experiments that sees the um, signatures of time reversal symmetry breaking in the strontium rutinate, but there are other ones. And I have to say that um, the, there are experiments that uh, support the, the, the fact that they su support uh, the conclusion that time reversal symmetry is broken. But there are other experiments which do not support them. So, so let me just list um, a number of them. So um, MUSR, also muons um, um, spin resonance uh, measurements, they also are sensitive to the ma magnetic uh, field effects, tiny magnetic field effects in the bulk. So they see evidence. Care effect, I explained. There is also some evidence from Josephson interferometry where um, they the experimentalists create different junctions, and they try to um, understand the interference pattern uh, of in the in the supercurrent for different geometries. But the, there is also a contradiction coming from this squid microscopy measurements from Cam Moller's group at Stanford. So the idea is that well, if you have this chiral P-wave superconductor, um, there should be some edge current in this. Uh, chiral P-wave superconductor because you imagine that these Cooper pairs are rotating um, in some uh, clockwise or counterclockwise fashion, so we should be able to measure pickups, the edge current. And what these guys do, they take a squid and they go around the sample and they try to detect this, um, this supercurrent. And it turns out that um, they don't find uh, any evidence. In fact, they, um, the theory predicts the signal 10 times larger than the precision of the measurements. So there is still some contradiction in, in, in this field. Um, 
And it appears that actually the progress in the field uh, sort of um, gets, gets stuck. So it's 2014, and we are at the stage of 2005, 2008, um, because the, syst the system is not very easy. So uh, I think that this, even up to now, this issue has not been resolved. Um, but anyway, the, the way my runners, if we have such a material, assuming that there is time reversal symmetry breaking, then there is a mechanism in which my runners can appear in this material, and I wanted to explain. Yes? Is it hard to do SPM on the construction uh, of the Why? So it's only, only split, so it's only split on uh, imaging the actual, an actual imaging of the edge mode, the possible edge mode. Why nobody's done SPM? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard because STMs, they usually have uh, not very high precision, right? So um, normally when you do, say, topological insulator measurement of band structure, then the broadening of, uh, uh, of the signal that you can measure is much larger than the temperature, characteristic temperature at which these experiments are performed, and certainly much larger than the um, TC. And so um, STM would, you would have to have a sort of low temperature version of STM which can measure, uh, which can resolve, um, I don't know, the gap structure, et cetera, which, um, I mean, those are not available in many labs. And in fact, I'm not sure one can resolve uh, one Kelvin even right now. Because usually for high TC measurements, you know, TC is 150 Kelvin or 100 Kelvin, so that's the different scale at which STMs are performed. But, but you know, letting aside some experimental complications, um, the question is, what would you measure with STM? So here we are trying to uh, distinguish whether there is time reversal symmetry breaking or not. Well, the system is gapped, fully gapped. So, uh, so um, you know, uh, th this effect certainly drops out from, from the density of states and things like so you that. You go on the edge and you see some in gap density of states on the edge. Yeah, so maybe you can see some, gap, some edge states. Um, but then one cannot conclude whether this is, uh, uh, you know, two counter-propagating edge states uh, or, or something like that. So, um, yeah. So I think we should, uh, one should pick up the measurement which is exclusively sensitive to time reversal symmetry breaking. Yes. Uh, disorder calculation, why does the Gaussian disorder give you zero for the half of activity? What's that? Sorry. Why does the Gaussian Um, well, uh, I don't have intuitive uh, explanation of this. Uh, perhaps, uh, yeah. Uh, so it comes out from the calculation. Um, and I can tell you that the only way one can get, um, may maybe there's some explanation, but the only way one can get some um, um, effect is to considering some asymmetry in the density of states. So um, if you consider not just linearized dispersion, but you consider particle hole asymmetry in the density of states, then even that um, disorder calculation, Gaussian disorder calculation, will give you um, some finite answer. Uh, but um, that would mean that, that we have a new parameter which is proportional to this asymmetry uh, in the density of states, and usually this is a very tiny quantity. Um, so, so anyway, it's not a universal number. It will depend on certain parameters, disorder concentration, etc. More questions? Okay, so let me just show you one mechanism how my runners can appear, uh, uh, assuming that we have this, you know, um, chiral key wave order parameter. So if you have, if you take a generic triplet uh, superconducting order parameter, uh, it's, it can be written in this form. So sigma are the um, Pauli matrices, and they represent the spin structure of the order parameter. Uh, and D uh, vector is uh, basically a vector that describes how the spin degrees of freedom are coupled to the orbital degrees of freedom. So normally, in S wave, say for example, superconductor, we have full quantum vortices as excitations. 
And these full quantum vortices correspond to a winding of the superconducting phase around vortex by 2 pi. Okay. But in this system, we have a new possibility. We have a possibility when this d vector changes the sign as we go around um, you know, vortex, around Fermi surface. And then uh, all the parameter, um, the phase of the other parameter, the other parameter has to advance only by pi. And so overall, um, the other parameter is still single value. So as you go around, you get to the same value. But it happens because of a, a different mechanism. So if I take a, some particular um, configuration for the d vector, I can rewrite this other parameter in the following form, which is very explicit. So it's like, um, so phi is a superconducting phase. And phi of k is some parameter that represents the orbital structure of the Cooper pair. And so it seems like we have um, you know, a, a, a vortex for, say, up-up component of the order parameter, but no vortex for down-down component of the order parameter. And so um, that allows, a, allows one to have this exotic object called half quantum vortex which corresponds to phi advancing by pi and also phi of k advancing by pi. And so this is the route to get a non-degenerate Majorana state because essentially in a spinful system, we have an excitation which has um, a mode, a Majorana zero, on, zero energy mode, only for up-up component, but no, no, no um, for down-down component. Well, the subtlety here is that well this spin winding around the uh, you know Fermi surface or around the vortex uh, creates a certain spin texture. Um, it's like you know winding of the superconducting phase. You know that um, it diverges with the uh, uh, logarithmic <laughs> with the size of the system logarithmically. And but but in the case of a superconductor, we know that somewhere far away there is a Meissner effect and there is screening of um, of, of, uh, so, so a screening of the magnetic field. So essentially, you know, at some point, this um, logarithmic energy cost will be, will be cut off by the um, Meissner effect. However, in this spin texture, um, there is no equivalent of the Meissner effect. Uh, so essentially, uh, a vortex like that will cost uh, logarithmically large energies. And therefore, it becomes unstable in bulk superconductors. However, if we consider some mesoscopic system where uh, you know, system is confined to um, some dimensions, like in this experiment by Budakian group uh, of the order of two microns, we can still have some evidence uh, of how quantum vortices. We can still, still detect some evidence of that. And in fact, that has been done uh, in this paper by uh, from the Budakian group. So essentially, they uh, created the mesoscopic sample. Um, this is a hole in the middle, and they use uh, uh, sorry, and they use this magnetometry technique to detect uh, very tiny orbital currents. And in fact, they show that um, um, the situation is different from just canonical S-wave superconductor, and you see some signatures of these half quantum vortices. So. Um, that's actually good news because you know this object um, is found in superconductor, but uh, I think prospects for observing Majorana are still uh, quite slim because uh, first of all you would like to have this in the bulk. This is a mesoscopic sample. Second of all, um, if you have even the vortex and even even if it has this uh, zero energy mode, there will be a, a tower of um, other states in the vortex, and so uh, it will be hard for us to resolve the zero energy mode because the other states are at the energies of delta squared over Fermi energy, and delta over E Fermi is uh, in typical superconductors uh, 10 to the minus 3, so it's a really tiny scale. It's uh, essentially almost like a continuum spectrum at the um, you know, reasonable temperature. So I would say that. Um, this system, um, it, it, it will be very challenging to observe um, Majorana in strontium glutonate. Any questions so far? How is this uh, a vortex behavior different 
Well, D-wave superconductors, um, they still have a half quantum vortex. Um, D-wave superconductor has uh, nodes, so um, you know, if, instead of having some localized uh, modes like you would have in S-wave or P plus IP superconductor, you would have um, essentially some extended states along certain symmetry axes. So, yeah, in this sense, it's, it's, it's very different. D-wave also, in D-wave superconductors, because transition temperature is large, and um, these vortices are very, very small, uh, they behave more like quantum objects, whereas uh, if you take an uh, S-wave superconductor, these vortices are almost like classical, because they are large. The size is large, coherence length is large. Okay, so um, I want to now go, go to a different system, uh, which was predicted by a um, number of people, uh, but I think the prominent uh, contribution was uh, done by Charlie Kane. Um, and so um, this is the system of topological, um, top, this is topological insulator, based on topological insulator. Okay, so you probably all know this since uh, uh, many of you are um, working on topological insulators, but just uh, to give you a, a very brief um, review, so this is the conventional band insulator, um, so it's just conduction band, balance band, and there's a gap in the spectrum. Now, if you take a two-dimensional quantum hole insulator, um, just an integer, then we'll have uh, just chiral edge mode connecting balance and conduction band. Uh, this is a time reversal symmetry broken phase. Uh, it turns out that there is a, a new phase, time reversal invariant phase, and that phase is characterized by um, helical edge states. So there is a spin up propagating you know, in this direction and spin down propagating in uh, the other direction. Um, then one can see that time reversal symmetry is preserved in such a system and in fact um, we will have, one can introduce the Z2 uh, topological invariant which essentially counts the number of crossings. Um, so, if, so the idea is that okay we can use this topological insulator for uh, creating Majoranus. And okay so this is 3D version of topological insulators. Uh, as you know, one of the features of strong topological insulators are that there are odd number of Dirac cones uh, per surface. In fact, it might be one. And if you have just one Dirac cone, that means essentially we already dealt with this problem of fermion doubling that I mentioned, that spin degeneracy, right? Because it's just one Dirac cone per surface. And so uh, there are two surfaces, but um, the Dirac cones are essentially split spatially. Then if I use uh, S-wave superconductor and place it on just one uh, of the surfaces, then there will be just one uh, Dirac cone and um, one can realize some some, some some version of topological, spinless topological uh, T-wave superconductor. So let me explain this in more details. Um, well, um, this, this topological insulator is characterized by uh, the low energy Hamiltonian for the, sur the surface uh, of topological insulator is characterized by just Dirac Hamiltonian, sigma dot P minus mu, mu is a chemical potential. So now, uh, if I add a superconductor, I place a superconductor on top, one has to add additional term, which appears because electrons can now uh, escape from the topological insulator into superconductor and um, tunnel back and forth. Okay, so um, normally the processes where electron is incident on the uh, S-wave or any superconductor is called, are called Andreev processes. Uh, and they pro these processes are characterized by the following um, scattering process. So you have spin up electron, uh, which is incident on some superconductor. And in this case, uh, this is S-wave superconductor. And then um, 
the Cooper pair is um, transmitted into a bulk of the superconductor, but uh, at the same time, a uh, hole is reflected back. So uh, if I want to describe a process like that, so Cooper pair uh, is in the superconductor, that means that two electrons from the topological insulator disappeared or, or, or created. And so that uh, um, is described by this proximity-induced S-way pairing mechanism. I will um, describe a more formal way of doing this calculation, but this is just for now a very cartoonish uh, um, picture. So uh, basically we would like to solve this Hamiltonian and we'd like to understand whether this Hamiltonian admits uh, as a Majorana zero energy mode. Uh, another way of uh, creating a uh, localized Majorana state is uh, going back to two-dimensional proposal and creating a domain wall between uh, a ferromagnet, which has some magnetization, and an S-wave superconductor. So it turns out that these two materials, they will open up different gaps. So superconductor opens up a gap because it pairs electrons with spin up and spin down, uh, and, super, uh, and magnetic um, insulator essentially um, you know, breaks time reversal symmetry. It also opens, opens up a gap of the, D, of the you know, Dirac electrons at the, um, it just, just opens up the Zeeman gap. And whenever you have a system which has sort of like two different gaps, there might be a situation where, um, in, in which there is a domain wall be between trivial and non-trivial phases. Uh, and that reminds us actually, uh, Alex, uh, you know, this Kitaev toy um, model because uh, you can think about vacuum as being as a trivial phase and then the uh, topological superconductor has been non-trivial phase. So at the domain wall, you will have a localized Majorana energy state. And um, another way of um, understanding this, whenever we have a mass which uh, is changing the sign at the domain wall, and that actually happens also here, um, such a Hamiltonian, such a Dirac Hamiltonian will um, localize a zero energy state. Okay, so, um, if you don't like qualitative arguments, you can do a very quantitative calculation. And in fact, that's your homework assignment, number one. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you'll just do explicit calculation. Consider this Dirac Hamiltonian, and, um, and now I'm adding the pairing, the, the, I'm adding actually vortex, which is described by this configuration. So delta is a function of R. Um, and theta is a superconducting phase. So um, this problem actually been solved a long time ago. That's your hint, but I hope you can solve it without, um, you know, re without invoking these uh, references. Um, it's a simple system. So um, it turns out that Dirac equation plus S wave vortex admits my random mode solutions. And these solutions are, you know, just written out here. So for some vortex configuration profile, delta of R, you can explicitly solve. And uh, from the structure of these solutions, you can show that that's indeed the case, that we indeed have the Majorana uh, Fermi zero mode. So um, this system, however, is different from the previous example in which time reversal symmetry was broken because in this case, time reversal symmetry is not broken, um, at least at the level of the band structure, and, um, and therefore it's a slightly different superconductor. Any questions? Uh, on the previous slide, you said Andrea reflection, and then you just wrote down a term with the proximity effect. The yes. Topological well, that the, the, this this is Andreas scattering. So I'm just uh, you know uh, one, one can so this a up down is essentially at zero frequency is this induced delta. Oh. So I use the uh, low energy approximation for the scattering process, and then you can write uh, some effective Hamiltonian which is valued that the scale is much less below the gap. And since we're looking for 
zero energy state, this approximation is still valid. Okay, so, so it seems like this uh, material is very promising because we know by now uh, um, whole, whole classes of topological insulators, we can pick ones that we like and uh, are convenient to work with and then try to um, realize my runners in the lab. And there are some challenges along the way, which I wanted to mention here. So, um, well, first of all, topological insulators are new mater materials, and uh, we have to understand them and we have to study them. And one challenge has been is to um, actually reduce the bulk conduction. So it turns out that for some material science reason, um, these topological insulators have substantial subgap conductance, and. Uh, for my runner purposes, that would mean that, well, even though we are opening gap at the surface of such a superconductor, but since states can penetrate inside, then uh, this my runner <coughs> mount will leak out inside, and that's, um, well, that, that will cause essentially decoherence, if you wish. Uh, you can use this language actually in this context. Uh, so uh, we would like to have, uh, you know, to reduce this con bulk conduction um, quite a bit. Um, secondly, we should uh, show that one can induce proximity, um, one, one can induce a large superconducting gap. Again, this is just an experimentalist, uh, uh, you know, it's a material science question. Many of the surfaces have some problems, they have some oxides of the interfaces, so that might be hard. Uh, and finally, you should also worry about surface disorder. Now, I want to mention this because um, there is a uh, belief that, well, if you have time reversal symmetry and it's an S-wave superconductor, then we should be okay w with respect to disorder. But we should also remember the fact that this is, you know, the, the order parameter that effectively appears in the system is in P-wave order parameter. And um, you know these unconventional order parameters are sensitive to disorder, so disorder should affect them um, in the structure. So you should make sure that the surfaces are clean enough uh, and uh, that the scattering cross section, that the um, mean free pass or one over tau is uh, fairly small compared to the superconducting gap. Um, in the case of two-dimensional topological insulators, um, the same two um, things apply. I, would, I should also mention that um, in certain systems, for example, indium arsenide, gallium antimony, we're even not sure uh, about the properties, edge states, because the temperature and magnetic field dependence is, uh, uh, is very strange, for example, these edges, uh, they seem to be very insensitive with respect to temperature, uh, and uh, they also are insensitive with respect to large magnetic fields, um, up to like 10 Tesla magnetic fields. So uh, according to the theory, uh, these large fields should uh, affect, I mean, the magnetic field should affect scattering, and so should certainly affect the conductance at the edge. So. I mean, there are certain things that need to be uh, clarified, both theoretically and experimentally, in this debate. Okay, so, um, but this example of uh, topological insulators and superconductors, heterostructures, it's actually a very nice example because it shows you that one can engineer certain Hamiltonians at the surface, right? We used topological properties of the uh, topological insulator and, you know, combined with the uh, S-wave superconductor to induce this proximity uh, term in the Hamiltonian, superconducting proximity term in the Hamiltonian, and we got a completely different um, state at the surface, a state that can potentially carry this Majorana zero energy state. So the question is whether we can use some other systems uh, and engineer these Hamiltonians by design. We know that well, we want to have a spinless P-wave superconductor, so how can we do that? Well, it turns out that it's possible to do using just 
um, simple, well-studied semiconductors. Uh, and the only uh, ingredients required are the strong spin-orbit interaction and large magnetic field. And those two combined, uh, turns out, al allow one to avoid spin degeneracy and at the same time allow one to induce a large proximity gap uh, even just using S-wave superconductor. So let me explain why. So first, um, if you have a two-dimensional quantum well, uh, which is constrained along Z direction, very often there is a very large electric field in these uh, quantum wells just because the bands are aligned, they have some um, band bending, or if we want, we can externally apply some gates and induce some very large electric fields. So if you have a system like that, uh, where electrons are moving uh, along the, say, xy plane, and this is z plane, um, and we have some electric field in this direction, then one can show by going to the rest frame that uh, uh, such a motion will induce some effective field acting on the spin. Therefore, there will be some spins, you know, there will be, in this effective, uh, this effective magnetic field will depend on the, of course, velocity of electrons and that can be captured by the following Hamiltonian, which is uh, so-called Rajba spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is just the parabolic dispersion, I have added this Rajba term, and it turns out that if you now diagonalize the uh, band structure, you will have this, this picture. That you'll have a small Fermi surface here and a large Fermi surface here, um, and they have spin texture, so they have there is some spin winding as one goes along the Fermi surface. So now I will take this band structure and I will add a magnetic field. So first I will put my chemical potential somewhere here where there is this Dirac cone. And you can see that this Dirac cone appears because you know at small momenta you can throw away these other terms and uh, when mu is equal to zero this, this looks like Dirac Newtonian. And then I will add um, some term, which is called Zeeman term, which will open up a gap in the uh, spectrum close to uh, zero momentum. Okay. So if you do that, we basically have only a single Fermi surface now. So before we had two Fermi surfaces, but in this parameter regime, we now have a single Fermi surface. Um, so this is the way of getting rid of spin doubling problem, right? Because uh, instead of having two Fermi surfaces, we now have one. But this Fermi surface is special, it's special in the sense that even though we open the gap in the spectrum, there is still some spin winding uh, along the Fermi surface. And as you know, for S-wave superconductor, uh, we want to pair states with opposite momenta and opposite spins. So then, if you look at this Fermi surface, we do have component with opposite momenta and opposite spins, and therefore um, such an S-wave superconductor will uh, open up a gap in the spectrum. So if I were just to take a Zeeman splitting and uh, set um, spin orbit coupling to zero, then this wouldn't work because all the spins will be polarized, and so there will be nothing to pair and I will have to use some exotic P-wave or some other superconductor to open up the gap. But the idea is here that we can use garden variety S-wave superconductor like aluminum, lead, or niobium, and uh, uh, we will open up a gap in the spectrum and have, uh, very, uh, and have the model which will have a single Fermi surface. So let me look into this model and let me um, show what happens precisely when we uh, couple this semiconductor to an S-wave superconductor. Now, I want to mention that almost all S-wave superconductors are heavily disordered. And as I said, that doesn't uh, affect the superconducting gap. Uh, so the reason for that is the, um, is the following. So let's, let's just first do the calculation without disorder. And so this calculation will involve certain processes where electrons, they tunnel into superconductor and they come back 
or you, you, can, um, you can say, well, we just want to integrate out the superconductor because it's gapped, right? So whenever we are integrating out something, uh, we will generate uh, self-energy. And so here's the form of the self-energy, uh, where tau is the Pauli matrix, which acts in the boost space. Uh, gamma is the uh, broadening, is basically a, a, a quantity that characterizes the uh, transmission probability through this interface. Delta is superconducting gap and mega is a frequency. So you can see that, well, if I, uh, if I am interested at the frequencies much lower than this gap, then I can safely ignore, you know, omega here, and then I can um, reduce this self-energy to something that can be explained as some effective Hamiltonian, right? Yes? Yeah, this might be a silly question, but uh, people believe that you need phonon uh scattering to have Google pairs in the yes. first place. So why don't you uh, have phonon term in the Hamiltonian? In which Hamiltonian? Uh, for the semiconductor? Uh, or for yes, the superconductor? Uh, say you have it in the superconductor, wouldn't it affect the uh, Hamiltonian which you are solving for the minor line states because it's in the interface? Yeah, so uh, there are two ways of thinking about proximity effect. One way is through um, you know, taking two materials with interactions. And um, so certainly a superconductor has you know, large BCS components, so it, it induces the superconductivity. And then you might think, well, it does extend into a, a semiconductor, right? But of course, the, um, these are two different materials, two different lattices. And so the phonon properties are very different. So for example, if you take just the simple semiconductor by itself and try to look at the superconducting phase, right? Then as you cool down um, one, we, we know that you know, these semiconductors don't go superconducting, mm -hmm. right? So uh, just phenomenologically, we can conclude that this term probably is not that important in semiconductor. Uh, uh, and that's a reason I'm dropping this term here. And so the mechanism that I'm considering is that, you know, Cooper pairs, they can leak out into the super con uh, semiconductor uh, and they can maintain the coherence for quite some time. And therefore they will, you know, induce the superconductivity in this way. And even if I have zero um, BCS coupling in the semiconductor itself, this mechanism is still present. Of course, if I have large phonon mediated coupling, then I have to take that into account. And maybe for some semiconductors, this is the important uh, to, to take into account, but I'm considering a situation where it's not. Does it make sense? Any other questions? So in the next question, if I look at DC, so I take omega to zero, and I set the superconducting gap to zero, it still, I still have some pairing. Well, OK, when you do that, then there is ambiguity, right? Uh, well, it's delta over. Because, delta. I mean, you're assuming. Um, you're, you're assuming that, uh, um, I mean, you're assuming that omega is less than zero and then you're taking a gap to zero, right? So omega to zero first and then gap to zero. Well, if you do the other way around, then you'll get uh, um, the broadening, which you would expect. Uh, so uh, I think that there is an order of limits. So if you set delta to zero first, right? Mm -hmm. Then the second term to which you refer vanishes. And so this term vanishes. This term becomes imaginary. And that basically just uh, gives you the, uh, uh, explains the fact that if you have a semiconductor coupled to a large bulk metal, the states in the semiconductor, they will develop some imaginary part. Uh, and I would think that this is the right procedure <laughs> actually to proceed in this situation. So do not set, you know, omega to zero first and delta to zero. That just gives you some physical answer. But if you set delta to zero, then omega to zero, then you recover the answer that makes sense, right? So if I set omega to zero, this term, so de delta to zero, excuse me, 
then this term is zero, this term is zero. This gives me imaginary part, right? And so I'll induce, I, I've induced exactly the term I gamma sine omega, which is something that you would get when you have a uh, large bulk metal close to a, a semiconductor. So I think it does make sense. Um, and you, you, can, you can try to check this expression by just doing explicit calculation. All right, so this expression is the answer for clean superconductor. Now, I want to understand what happens if superconductor is disordered. And it's important because they are usually very disordered, so tau and delta is much less than one. Well, it, it turns out that we can get exact answer in, in, you know, in some approximation. We can get in some approximation uh, uh, the, the answer to this problem. Um, and so the only thing that we need to, to do is now to dress the superconducting Green's function with disordered diagrams. So um, it turns out that that problem can be solved exactly, and it's been done in the 60s by uh, Abrikosov and Gorkov. And so um, it amounts to just the rescaling omega and delta by, by these factors, eta of omega. And you can see that, well, while this rescaling changes the Green's function, it doesn't change this expression because both omega and delta in the uh, numer numerator and denominator will be scaled by the same functions. So essentially, the disorder will drop out from uh, this formula. And uh, the conclusion that we get from this calculation that as long as uh, there is no disorder in the semiconductor itself, uh, the disorder in the superconductor is not that important. And there are some contributions which correspond to this part um, sort of coupling disorder between different uh, Green's functions, but one can show that this part is actually very, very small. Uh, and so up to these very small corrections, we can um, ignore the effect of disorder in the superconductor. So that actually is a very good news for us because it seems like you know, our model checks out and um, it provides a very realistic assessment of the situation in the um, realistic conditions. Okay, so now I'll try to convince you that if you take this band structure, Rajbar plus Zeeman term, and you add the superconducting S-wave coupling, that it actually indeed corresponds to a, a spinless P plus AP superconductor that I uh, explained in the previous lecture. Uh, to do that, we'll just uh, first diagonalize this part. So you know, this is Zeeman term, this is Rajbar term, We'll diagonalize this term, and um, um, these eigenfunctions, psi plus and psi minus, correspond to these bands. And then we will assume that this gap is large here, and the chemical potential is in the middle. And so then uh, we will uh, project out this um, excited band. So I'm going to now rewrite this induced pairing in terms of these new eigenstates and project out the uh, psi plus band. So as you project out, as one would expect, the only term that uh, is left is this psi minus psi minus, and one can explicitly check, and that's your homework assignment number two, uh, that it's indeed Px plus IPy superconductor. Okay, and this is something that one would expect because we have sort of this chirality built in at the Fermi surface, we uh, projected the spin degrees of freedom, so it's just a single Fermi surface, right? And um, therefore, a pairing has to be uh, odd on the P, okay? Um, and uh, because of the spin orbit, um, essentially, spin orbit induced texture of the Fermi surface, we have Px plus IPy. Now, this is a qualitative argument why this should happen, but one, in fact, can do a very rigorous calculation using this Hamiltonian without any approximations. So the way to do that, I outlined before. So we, want, we know that the spinless uh, chiral P-wave superconductor has a trivial topological index. Um, it's index first, ch first uh, churn number. Uh, so if we compute very uh, curvature and then compute this integral over the whole brilliant zone, uh, we will get, uh, if the system indeed corresponds to this topological 
uh, superconductor, we will get that it's equal to one. And this is the condition when this happens, um, and it can be shown just from this calculation. Whereas if, the, if this um, Zeeman-induced splitting is larger than this number, and that means that we cannot project this band out anymore, then um, it, turns, it, it uh, uh, becomes a trivial superconductor. Yes? We are doing a projection uh, where this has a, induced a barrier phase, a charge one half barrier phase. Yeah. Uh, so, so what do you mean the P plus IP? So well, you have a barrier phase at the level of band structure, and this barrier phase um, gets carried over into this PX plus IPY in a new basis. So I'm just doing a change of basis where you know, this barrier phase, which was in sort of like semi semiconducting states, mm -hmm. gets transferred into the superconducting P PX plus IPY or the parameter. So it's just a change of basis in some sense. But in this basis, your single particle part is trivial, so it's just the parabolic dispersion, uh, whereas the other parameter has non-trivial winding. Whereas in the original Hamiltonian, the uh, pairing was trivial, but there was some winding in the single particle part. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We can change the basis, you know, and th uh, this calculation shows that this is unambiguous. So does this Explanation is valid for any type of crystallographic direction, and because the Rajba term can have a different symmetry. So, is it valid for any crystallographic direction for semiconductor? And Philips has IPY and this in textures, which you assume that has this special symmetry, which you have mentioned. Well, um, Rajba usually, uh, I mean, in realistic experimental settings, I have to be more careful, but uh, I think it, you're referring to Dressel House. Dressel House usually depends on, on directions and you know some symmetry breaking in the bulk. Is, is that what you're referring to, spin orbit coupling? Rajba usually is a very simple term. I mean, if you have some anisotropy, if I take a crystal anisotropies, then it will certainly depend because velocities will depend. But generically, it happens because there is some electric field outside of the plane. Two terms are being added to each other. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so if you add Rajba and Dresselhaus, then um, there are situations for which one cannot open uh, the gap because along these directions, the two terms will essentially cancel each other. So one has to pick a material or pick an orientation growth where this doesn't happen. But that's a good question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So in this proposal, Zeeman, uh, Zeeman field is introduced by taking some magnetic insulator and coupling to the uh, semiconductor. We cannot apply magnetic, so that's one, one way. If you have the situation where you have Rajba and Dressel House, there's also another way because you can apply in-plane field. Um, but I will show you actually that, well, um, in 1D, uh, the situation becomes very simple, and uh, um, the proposal becomes explicit, you know, very, very simple because then there is no problem with different anisotropies. You just pick one axis. You can apply in-plane field, and uh, you can use also. Uh, that actually is my next slide. Um, so in 2D, of course, it's hard because you have to create two interfaces, one is semiconductor, and superconductor, another one, sort of semiconductor and magnetic insulator. Um, or you have to study the structure very well and know the orientations of the Dressel house and Rajba terms and then uh, apply an appropriate in-plane field. But um, this problem can be avoided in one dimensions. And in one dimensions, I can just use a Rajba spin orbit coupling and just the Zeeman field along the direction uh, of the wire. The main idea is that these two uh, Pauli matrices um, do not commute. And so at the end of the day, the, we, we will open a gap in the spectrum because they do not commute. So you have to avoid uh, the situations where a uh, magnetic field is applied along the direction of, say, you know, this Pauli matrix, then we, we will have a gapless system. 
Okay, so uh, this is a, a, a picture. It, this is Rajba. It's kind of a one-dimensional cut of the previous band structure. So you have two bands shifted by some um, momentum P, um, which is proportional um, to the um, spin orbit coupling, and then um, this is Daemon field, Daemon field, field induced by this magnetic field. So uh, what's the idea here is the idea is that we need to find semiconductors which have large G factors. Um, and we have to make sure that these semiconductors will have very nice contacts, will form very nice contacts with the uh, with metals. And <clears throat> Uh, in this case, large G factor allows us to open a very large gap in the spectrum here without affecting the superconductor itself. Because normally, superconductors um, are conventional metals with G factor of order two. So if the difference is between like you know 50 and two, um, there are fields at which uh, there is the the, the magnetic field uh, does not affect essentially a superconductor but opens a very large gap in the spectrum for uh, a semiconductor. And so that's the key idea here, that we, um, we have such semiconductors such as, say, indium antimony, um, and they also have very large spin orbit coupling. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, in, in this um, system, uh, one can just uh, do a simple explicit calculation using this uh, effective Kitayev model and show that there are two phases. And again, the same topological condition, the same condition for the phase boundary uh, is satisfied. And what is important is that in this, in, in this proposal, we can just tune magnetic field to drive the system from non-topological to topological phase. And that's what actually very important. Because uh, there are systems where you can have topological and topolo non-topological phases, but th that would require growing different structures. When we grow different structures, we will have different parameters. And you know, many things will change, disorder, couplings, etc. Here, it's one system, and you can uh, basically distinguish, and you can see what changes as you go across transition. You can distinguish between topological and non-topological phase just by changing the magnetic field. I think that's a big advantage. So um, finally, for this structure, you can plot density of states. This is density of states as a function of energy and the function of length of the wire. And you can see this Majorana zero energy peaks. They are exponentially localized uh, at the ends of the wire. There are also some oscillations associated with some Friedel type of physics. But you can see that there are no other states up to the gap. At least in this simple model, there are no other states up to the gap. So there is a chance that we can resolve these zero energy states in, uh, in experiments. Whereas in the other um, phase, non-topological phase, these peaks just disappear and, um, and uh, one should be also be able to distinguish. So, uh, so basically, let me like conclude this uh, section by uh, outlining the challenges. So, the uh, as I alluded, the 2D Majorana proposal based on semiconductor superconductor heterostructures um, requires two interfaces, and that's a challenge because making an interface uh, is really really hard. Um, Low disorder, we again, when we make interfaces, we have to make sure that these interfaces are smooth so that we are not introducing disorder. Uh, and you also have to tune the density so that the density is in the right parameter regime. Um, I think one of the uh, less restrictive proposals, so again, we, we need to um, have a low disorder system, we need to tune the density to some extent, uh, and we need to find a system which has large spin orbit coupling and a uh, large G factor. Yes? Yeah, so if you take uh, in-plane magnetic field, 
then uh, orbital contribution can be minimized because we will take a uh, you know, very tiny wire. Um, the superconductor is very thin. Um, the bulk superconductor can be as thin in some cases as you know, 50 nanometers. So that's a very, t so essentially these effects are quenched. All right, so uh, I think uh, I have, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So in the last five minutes, I wanted to just uh, prepare for the next lecture and, and give, uh, tell you a little bit about experimental signatures and experimental progress in, in, in this direction. So um, there has been a number of recent developments uh, over the last couple of years where people have created the structures outlined uh, on the previous slides. They created this one-dimensional heterostructures and they measure different properties which are probing the Majorana uh, signatures. And in particular, uh, I'll talk about zero bias tunneling conductance. Uh, and you can see majority experiments are um, focused on, on this measurement. And essentially this measurement tells you that, you know, if you cross the phase transition, topological phase transition, then there should be emergence of this zero bias peak zero bias, uh, sorry, uh, there should be emergence of the zero energy state. And this zero energy state should manifest when one tunnels into the end of the wire. And so we will probe the band structure by doing this, this, this experiment. Uh, there is another experiment that has been attempted by uh, Rochinson, um, and it's so-called fractional Josephson effect. Um, so this effect is uh, also very exotic because um, conventional Josephson effect has two pi periodicity. And it's actually a, a manifestation of the fact that two E electrons are tunneling from one superconductor to the other superconductor. In fact, Josephson effect for, uh, for a long time also was one of the standards of measuring the charge of, um, of an electron. And so um, it tells you that this is very robust effect. So now, in this system, because we have zero energy states, um, we don't have to have Cooper pair tunneling. Actually, there might be electron tunneling across the junction. And that would mean that the Josephson effect now has a different fundamental periodicity, which is 4 pi. And uh, um, this 4 pi periodicity can be probed in some uh, time-dependent AC measurements. Uh, okay, so this is my uh, cartoon for zero bias uh, zoo. Well, uh, if somebody tells you, okay, I have a system and I measure it and I see zero bias anomaly, so therefore I've seen a Majorana zero energy state, there will be a number of experimentalists that will jump out and, and will say, well, how do you know that you measured Majorana zero energy state? Because there are so many other um, physical mechanisms for zero bias anomaly that um, you know everybody can come up with the probably like their own <laughs> explanation. So the idea is that when you do the measurement here, we have to rule out all the other possible effects. And um, you know here's a, a list, and I will um, explain. I will discuss this in the next lecture. Um, and there might be some other animal also appearing, uh, and something, <laughs> some new um, animal will pop up, so you'll have to watch out and be extremely careful. Uh, but just going ahead, um, I wanted uh, to end with this slide and explain why zero bias uh, tunneling conductance uh, will emerge in, in this system. So let's imagine we have this wire, this is a superconductor, there is magnetic field. We created this wire and now we can tune magnetic field and drive this system into topological and non-topological phase. Then we take some STM, for example, and we can tunnel to the end of this wire. Well, it turns out that there, are, there will be two different um, signatures at zero temperature in topological and non-topological phase. Um, and so in topological phase, 
will have exactly 2 e, two e squared over h uh, conductance, whereas in non-topological phase, the, at zero bias, it's going to be equal to zero. So what's the reason for that? Well, the reason for that is, so, is again, um, Andre reflection, but in this case, we will have so-called resonant Andre reflection. What does mean reson what is resonant Andre reflection? It's a reflection where uh, incoming electrons have energy uh, equal to zero. So it turns out that because um, there is a resonance between electrons at the Fermi energy and the zero bias and the zero energy state in the superconductor, that um, the Andreev reflection probability is equal to one. And you can see that using the, the a very simple calculation. So this is the standard calculation, scattering ma matrix calculation for the current in um, SN structure. So uh, these are Fermi functions, and this is the probability. Well, it turns out this is the scattering probability uh, for a particle hole sort of uh, component, which corresponds to Andrea reflection. Well, it turns out that at zero energy, one can, there are only two choices because this scattering matrix is very constrained. So first there is unitarity, and then we also have particle hole symmetry. So using these two, um, um, using these two constraints, we can only have two answers. And so there is an answer where we have complete reflection, Andrea reflection. So nothing is transmitted. This is so-called, you know, uh, normal processes. So actually everything, um, so sorry, complete normal reflection. Uh, I made a mistake. Complete normal reflection. So electron comes in and they yes, actually gets back scattered as an electron. And that's this scattering mat matrix. Uh, and then complete um, un Andrea transmission. So the particle hole transmission probability is equal to one because you can see that this component, this is, this is the scattering matrix. So uh, this is particle, particle, this is whole, whole component, but you can see that particle whole component uh, absolute value is equal to one. And so um, at zero energy, this process happens at, uh, with unit probability, and therefore we expect to see zero bias standard conductance in the uh, experiments. So uh, with this, I will conclude this lecture and uh, continue from this point on next time tomorrow. Questions? Two D, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> well, if you have say Dressel House okay. and Rajba, right? Wow. Then uh, that was the question uh, that was asked before. Then I can pick some directions of the magnetic field where I can satisfy all the conditions in in a sense. Um, I will open up a gap in the spectrum and I have a gap system. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is to use this insulator on top. Uh, and then there is some Zeeman splitting uh, induced due to some exchange uh, of particles between magnetic insulator and your semiconductor. But that, that requires the structure with two interfaces and I think it's very hard. No, with Rajba and uh, two interfaces, then you will get uh, you will get uh, because it's along z direction, so you will you will get um, you will, you can open the gap. But I don't know whether this can be done. And it certainly, isn't, was not demonstrated experimentally yet. It has not been demonstrated experimentally yet. Right.